Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Genesis, the first book in our Bible, uh, the 32nd chapter, and I'm going to start reading at verse 22. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. This is the word of God for us this morning. Very interesting passage I want us to really uh, dig into this morning, and uh, we're going to talk a lot about wrestling. I almost felt like I should wear my wrestling singlet this morning, um, but lots of votes against that, so that was probably wise not to uh, wear it. Um, but uh, we're really going to be doing some wrestling, and I believe that wrestling is definitely a part of, of worship. Uh, of embracing Christ, and I hope we see that uh, in this passage. Uh, to get the full uh, context of this passage, I think we need to remember Jacob's life. You know, we hear a lot about all the different characters in the Old Testament, uh, the people there, and sometimes we forget who's who and, and what the, is their life story, and so I want us to remember Jacob's life story. Uh, he was born a twin. He has a twin brother, Esau, uh, born the same day, but Esau was born first. So Esau was the firstborn son, which back in these times was very important. If you were the firstborn son, uh, you would carry on the family name, the tradition. Uh, everything was important and, and kind of was important to the firstborn son. Secondborn, thirdborn, all those were okay, but that firstborn was the important one. When it came for inheritances, uh, the firstborn got twice as much as everybody else. And so being the firstborn son was important, and that's who Esau was, Jacob's older brother. Uh, Jacob was that, that secondborn. He was always kind of striving to become the firstborn, um, but that's not who he was. That was not uh, the order in which he was born. Uh, but as Jacob grew up, he's, his father's Isaac, and he began to kind of, um, they called him a trickster as he grew up. Uh, Jacob, I consider him a person that would take advantage of situations and even take advantage of people if it would benefit him. And so that was kind of his character, and it happened quite a bit. Uh, in Genesis 25, he is uh, at home, and his brother Esau, the firstborn, comes home and is starving, is really hungry, and Jacob has a bowl of stew, and Jacob says, I'll give you a bowl of stew for your birthright. Remember, this birthright's twice as much as uh, Jacob's. Well, he said, for your birthright, I'll give you a bowl of stew. And uh, Esau takes it. He says, you can have my birthright, just give me some food. Which again, he kind of tricks him, but I'm also like, Esau should have just said no uh, to that deal. That's not a great deal, uh, but he took it. And so uh, Jacob received his brother's birthright, the firstborn. And then in Genesis 27, uh, Isaac, his father, is dying. Uh, he's blind, and so he cannot see, and he wants to bless his firstborn son. And so the family knows that he wants Esau to come in and receive that blessing of the firstborn son. But Jacob's mother says, why don't you sneak in and pretend to be uh, Esau, and you will get that firstborn's blessing. And so Jacob puts on his brother's clothes. He puts goat skin on his arms because his brother is very hairy and allows his father to touch that hair on his arm. And he receives the blessing of the firstborn uh, by his father before he dies. And so he's kind of this guy that just uh, tricks people and, and takes advantage of situations. After that one, though, Esau wasn't very happy with him, and Jacob left their family. He ran off fearing for his life uh, because of the anger of his brother. And while he was off, he, he met a girl and got married and had two wives and two maidservants and 11 children. As you heard, he has a 12th one later. Uh, but also while he was off in this other place, uh, he was caring for sheep and the goats of his father-in-law. And again, he kind of tricks his father-in-law. He uh, talks to his father about, about how he's going to be paid for the work that he's been doing for him. And he says, how about I just take the goats and the sheeps with speckles or spots on them? And, and you, uh, my father-in-law, you keep all the ones that aren't. And the father-in-law says, okay, that sounds like a good deal. So that's probably just a percentage of the goats and sheep. But what uh, Jacob then does is he makes sure only the goats and sheep that are speckled or spotted are the ones that reproduce. And so all the new animals belong to Jacob, and no more new animals belong to his father-in-law. And so he, he fulfills his flock 
uh, while depleting the flock of his father-in-law. And it's right after that that we have this passage here. Uh, Jacob has been kind of tricking and, and taking advantage of people, and now he's going back home. Uh, it's been 20 years since he saw his brother, and, and I believe that part of this wrestling that's going to take place is a part of, of who Jacob was. He's, uh, on the inside, he's wrestling with uh, what's going to happen as he meets up with his brother. Is his brother still mad at him? Is his brother still going to try and kill him after 20 years because of the things that he had done to him? And so he sends out his family all in front of him so his brother will see them first and hoping to uh, kind of work on Esau's heart and say, Esau, if you kill me, you have to take care of all these people. All these people are relying on Jacob. And so he's trying to soften his heart with all these things uh, that are before him. And then he goes to sleep. And it's that night that he begins wrestling with this uh, mystery man, really. We don't know who it is, especially at the beginning of the passage. We don't know who he's wrestling with, but they wrestle all night until uh, daybreak. And that's when he asked the, the mystery man to bless him. And, and he says, well, what is your name? He says, it's Jacob. He says, no longer is your name Jacob. You are now Israel. And this is where the Israelites come from. The Israelites will be uh, the 12 sons of Jacob, will become the 12 tribes of Israel. And so his name has been changed to Israel. And then he is blessed by the mystery man, then disappears. And we don't know exactly who it is. It might be an angel. It's probably some heavenly being. It might be God in the flesh, like Jesus Christ right there wrestling with him, uh, because that's who Jacob or Israel thought it was. He said, I've wrestled with God face to face, and, and I have overcome. And it's through that wrestling that Jacob is transformed, and that's what the name change symbolizes. He was Jacob, now he's Israel. He was this man, this trickster, this uh, guy that took advantage of people, but now he is Israel. And he doesn't do that as much the rest of his life. He's a different person because he has wrestled and struggled with God. And see, that's where I see uh, worship happening in this passage. That it's through that wrestling, through that struggle, that God transforms Jacob. And I believe it's through worship that we are transformed as well. It's through that struggle that we become uh, more like the image of Christ in our lives. And so that's a uh, part of what we wanna do is to embrace Christ in order to be transformed. In the last three weeks, we've been talking about our vision, uh, to be a church where you can see Christ. We wanna represent Christ in all that we do. And uh, the way we live that out is we do three things. We serve, experience, and embrace Christ. We serve Christ in ministry. We want everyone in our congregation uh, to be connected to some ministry, whether that's inside the church or outside the church. Just find a place to serve. Uh, the next one is experiencing Christ in small group. We want everyone to be in a small group uh, where they can grow and study and experience Christ together. And then today we're looking at embrace, how we worship Christ together and how we embrace Christ and hold on to him as a, an act of worship and how that transforms us in our lives. And, and I wish I could stand here and just tell you, here's all you have to do to worship. I wish I could do that. That worship is just the, this one thing, the same thing for everybody, but I believe worship is different. I believe there's a varieties of ways that we worship God. There's a variety of ways that we embrace Christ and, and are, are held close uh, to God's heart. And so we, we need to just grow and look at those different ways. Uh, some people worship God in traditional style uh, worship. Others in contemporary or modern style worship. They're different. They're not one better than the other or one worse. They're just different. Uh, they're different ways that we worship. Um, sometimes we worship God in silence. Sometimes we worship God in song. Sometimes we worship God by reading the Bible alone. Other times we read it with other people. Sometimes we worship God by serving others and caring for them. So there's all different kinds of ways to worship God. And, and the, it's just from our heart that we do those things. And it's up to us and our experience and our personality that uh, allows us to connect and worship in that way. And that's one thing I want you to remember is that um, you worship out of part of your personality. I've been reading a lot about that lately. Uh, that it depends on who God has made you to be uh, will lead to what worship is meaningful to you. Uh, if you're an extrovert, um, then you like certain parts of the service where you get to talk to other people and, and connect with others. And maybe even during prayer time, you might uh, be more open to sharing your joys and concerns or, or praying with somebody else. If you're an introvert, uh, you don't want to do that. You don't want to talk to anybody. You just want to be there. And maybe that time of silence in prayer is important to you because you can just kind of turn inside and turn inward in your prayers and allow God to hear the, the cries of your heart. And so if you're an extrovert or introvert, you'll worship differently. Different things will connect with you. Uh, as you listen to a message, if you're a thinker, um, then you'll connect with a message that offers you something new to think about. When it gives you new information or an idea to struggle with or you learn something, uh, you connect well with the message if you're a thinker. If you're a feeler, then you want those st personal stories that kind of tug at your heartstrings, your, your emotions want to be connected to the message, and, and that's how you worship. And so we worship differently, and that's okay. 
you don't need to worship like somebody else or, or see someone else. I remember when I was younger, I'd say, I need to worship like them because they're doing it right, you know? I had friends that would raise their hands when they would sing, and I'm like, okay, I need to do that or I'm not doing it right. And, and I found out that's kind of more of an extrovert type way to worship, to do that external thing. Uh, but as an introvert, I'd rather just close my eyes and, and allow that music to kind of sink into my soul. And so I learned I don't have to worship like them. I want to worship how I do. And, and you need to find the same thing for you. What's the way that, that you worship? Uh, whether it's with a group or in your personal time as well. I love reading through the Bible in a year. I do that every single year. Uh, I get through the whole thing, and I just like the quiet time that I get as I read it and, and get into wor God's Word. And I, as I said, I've read it every year, and yet something new jumps out at me each time I read it. And I'm like, oh, I'm reminded of something new that God wants to speak to me. And, and I enjoy that. Find the thing that is right for you uh, in your weekly uh, time with God, your daily time with God. Uh, and as you worship him in your personal time. If you want help with that, let me know. I have all kinds of charts and books and things that can uh, help you find those things depending on your personality and your experience. And I can help you find and connect in those ways. Uh, but there is one thing I want us to know today uh, in worship that is for all of us. And, and that comes from this passage as we've looked at it uh, with Jacob wrestling, that there's a, a sense in embracing Christ and, and worshiping God uh, that we at times are struggling that we at times are, are kind of working through things. And uh, it's not always real comfortable and, and nice and, and easy. Um, when I was back in college, I had a religion professor that I just enjoyed. I respected him very much and listened to everything he said. And one of the things I remember uh, still to this day that he said was, if you and God don't disagree, then you're worshiping the wrong God. If you and God don't disagree, then you're worshiping the wrong God. And at the time, I didn't understand exactly what he was meaning by that because I was young in my faith and God and I were best buds. I mean, we did everything together and uh, we agreed on everything because I just wanted to do whatever God said. And he seemed to say the things that I wanted to hear. And, you know, we were real close. But as I've grown in my faith, I've learned I do disagree with God at times. There are times that I'm even angry at God because I think he should have done something different than what he did. And I wrestle with what God is calling me to do. And, and I finally understood what my teacher was saying. He said, if you and God agree on everything, then that means you're really kind of telling God what to tell you. In a sense, you're shaping God in your image instead of allowing God's image to shape you. And, and let me just kind of explain a little bit what that means, what, what that looks like. Um, you know, I, God and I get along great when he says, love your family and love your friends. I can do that. That's really easy. I, I love it when God says, love your family and friends. But when God says, love your enemies we start to disagree a little bit. When he says, here's this person that has hurt you and you have to love them. Here's this person that has hurt someone you love and you have to love them. Here's this person that's taking advantage of you. You are to love them. God and I start to struggle. We start to wrestle a little bit when he starts calling me to love my enemies. And so that's part of that, that struggle. That's God's image being shaped on us. You know, God and I get along great when he says, just give a little bit of your time and your money. We get along great. It's wonderful when he says, just give a little bit. But then he starts saying, give a little bit more. Give a little bit more. Give a little bit more. And we start to wrestle then. And we start to struggle. Uh, because God wants to call us to so much more than we often think is possible. God wants to call us deeper and, and further in our faith to step out. And so what my professor was saying, that if, if your faith is all comfortable... It's all happy and easy, and God always just says the things I like him to say, then you're probably worshiping the wrong God. You're making God in your image instead of allowing his image to be imprinted on you. And so worship is a place for us to struggle. It's a place where God will call us deeper, call us further in our faith to take the next step, not to just stay comfortable and stay back. When we embrace Christ, when we get so close to God, uh, it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable at times because he wants so much more of his love and his mercy and grace to be seen in us than we want to show in ourselves. And so he wants that image of him to be reflected in each and every one of us. And that's painful at times. It's uncomfortable. And I don't think you should do that all the time because that would be difficult to always be struggling, always be wrestling. But if God hasn't challenged you lately, then you need to maybe get a better grip on him. Get a, a more of an embrace. Be open to what God really might be calling you to because it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be a bit of wrestling in the midst of that time. Uh, but God calls us to continue to grow in his image. Uh, one of my seminary professors was kind of teaching me this. Uh, as we thought of one of the things Jesus calls us to in Matthew 16 is to pick up your cross and follow me. Now, if you read that, does that sound happy and nice? 
to pick up a cross and follow him? Because what's a cross for? A cross is to take life, right? A cross is a symbol of suffering, of pain, even of death. And so if Jesus says, pick up your cross, he's not saying, pick up a happy, go fun time, you know, and just do these things with me. That's not what he's saying. He'd pick up your cross. And, and sometimes we think, well, my cross is that annoying person I have to put up with every day. You know, that's my cross to bear. My cross is that cranky neighbor that always is yelling at my kids. Or my cross is my boss who I can't stand. Uh, that's not what your cross is. Um, my professor, uh, Robert Mulholland, he said, your cross is that point in which you are unlike the image of God. It's that point of unlikeness with God. It's your, your heart or your mind or your actions or your words that don't reflect Christ. It's the things that you do and the things that you are that are not about love, mercy, and grace in this world. That's the cross that you have to bear. That's the cross you have to pick up because it's, it's when we pick up that part that we're not like God and, and um, we begin to worship that God says, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna smooth out those rough edges. I'm going to take away some of that anger that's been coming out, uh, which is not easy to give up. He says, but I want to take that away because that doesn't show my love to this world. I'm going to take away that loneliness and an insecurity that you have. I, I want you to give that up because that's not who I made you to be. And that's not easy again to give up. But God wants to take it. It's, it's a struggle. It's, it's wrestling with him because he wants his image to be on us, not our image on him. And that's what happens when we fully and truly embrace and, and worship God. We get closer to him and then become more like him and reflect his love and mercy and grace on this world. Uh, so I challenge you, I encourage you to think about, has your worship been very comfortable? Has it been uh, kind of nice and, and what you want? Or, or has it at times been a struggle? Has God been challenging you to, to step a little further, to take a risk, uh, to grow in love and mercy and grace? Uh, showing that to all people, those that you love and those that might be your enemies uh, because he calls us to love them as well. I believe that's what Jacob was wrestling with. He was wrestling with who he had been, uh, his own image in himself, and who God was calling him to be. God was calling him to be Israel, uh, the father of the descendants of all his people. That's a, that's a high calling for a man. And God was beginning to shape him into that man that he wanted him to be. I believe through worship, God is shaping you as well, if you allow him to. Allow him to put his image onto you and to shape you into the man and the woman that, that God has called you to be. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a struggle. It's going to be some wrestling. Um, but God's perfect love and grace can be made known in us so that we can show Christ to others uh, in our worship. Uh, get a grip of him. Embrace him. Uh, and, and worship him fully as he transforms us into who he's called us to be. Let us pray. Gracious God, I thank you that um, you call us to be so much more. So often we settle for the easy, we settle for the things that are comfortable, and yet you want us to, to grow, uh, to dig deeper into our faith, to, to follow you more closely, to pick up our cross and be made into the image of Christ. Uh, Lord, help us to, to run to you, uh, to grab a hold of you, to, to get a grip of you that you might transform us. Uh, it's not going to be easy, uh, but it's going to be worth it. And it's going to be beautiful as you put your image into each and every one of us. We pray this all in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.